morning. It is a privilege to be able to share the word with you this morning. Uh, let's go ahead and just uh, begin with a word of prayer and give Lord the thanks and his due this morning. Father, we give you praise and honor. Thank you that we can not only hear, but each and every day lift you up, humble ourselves and lift you up. And even as we have sung, uh, may that be true. Uh, if it helps us set our eyes on you and not merely upon our stuff and upon answers and not merely upon problems. And Lord, we thank you that as we share the word this morning, that you would help us to see around corners, that you would help make crooked places straight, that you would lead our feet on level ground by your good spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's really one thing that I don't like about preaching and teaching. Want to know what it is? It's that you many times get experienced stuff in preparation for. How many know that everybody that gets up front and preaches or teaches the word has not mastered everything? It's not just me. That's good. Yesterday, how many know what the little smart key fobs are in your automobile? They're not smart, they're stupid. <laughs> what was wrong with the old key? I mean, the only thing you could really do is bust it off or bend it, but we had to change the batteries in the smart key, which clearly is smarter than I am. And so I take it apart, I get the appropriate batteries and begin to put it back together. Not so much. They uh, conveniently grease the batteries. It's on purpose. So my hands are covered with this little Vaseline-like substance. And I'm trying to grasp three little plastic pieces. And, you know, of course, when they show you how to do it, you know, it just snaps right together. It, it's not doing that. And I know, because I've broken many things, that cheap little plastic breaks very easily. And if I break something off in there, I'm going to have to go to a dealer, tell them what I did, which they're going to know anyway, and I'm going to potentially have to order a new one, which are like, what, 300 bucks, something like that, depending on your car. So I wrestled and wrestled and wrestled. Then I did another dumb thing. I took the other one apart. <laughs> you can see where this is headed. Because I figured I might as well change them both at the same time and be done with it. And so I did that to make sure that I'm putting it together properly, which I was, but it still wasn't working. Long story short, as my wife witnessed this, at some point, and I had, I had prayed, meaning I had said, Jesus, you can create the world in six days, but I can't put this stupid little key together in like six minutes or it was approaching, you know, 15 Finally, my wife said, well, she had prayed, and of course, long story short, with me doing yoga, whatever that is, to hold it, because I needed like seven hands, they finally came together. And of course, my first thought to her was, why didn't you lead with that, with prayer? Anyway, long story short there, again, an opportunity for me to be taught, and the issue of prayer and authority and taking dominion, all the things that we've uh, really been sharing about uh, a great example. I'd love to tell you that I was Jesus in the flesh, but I was just more flesh, and uh, we got through it. I want to hone in this morning on our spiritual authority and just start with a simple question. Under whose authority are we? Um, now, the easy, easy, obvious answer is, well, Jesus' authority, God's authority. And yet many times I find that we step out from under that authority and we get into a dangerous place, a dangerous area. How many of you have ever prayed prayers that just didn't seem to get answered? I mean, lots of us. How many have struggled with situations that don't seem to be turning around? Uh, how many times does our theology seem suspect? I mean, we think we know it's right, but things aren't working as they should, like with this stupid little key, and we struggle in that place. 
Uh, Ron shared the last of our uh, Rediscovering the Kingdom classes just last week, and it touched on this area of authority and dominion and how it is that we uh, actually flesh out this thing called doing His will on earth as it is in heaven. How many know it? I hope it's easier in heaven than it is on earth uh, because it is a struggle for us to figure out what that looks like. How many times was Jesus himself asked, mostly by religious people, under whose authority are you doing these things? And, you know, that, that's kind of a negative when we look at it from the Pharisees' perspective because they often challenged him, but they recognized authority in Jesus. And can I tell you that they should recognize authority in you and I as well? And we become scared of being Jesus in the earth today. That's daunting. That's intimidating. And yet that's what we're called to do, and that's who we are called to be. Amen? I lost some of you. Some of you are waiting. You're going to wait. It's all right. Jesus in the flesh is represented today by you and I. That's, a, that's as simple as I can say it. And while that makes some theologians nervous because we get into some shaky ground, and can I tell you, I'm not talking about fully dominion theology. There's some theology out there called dominion theology that has some good things in it, and it has some untruth. It has some overbalance in some areas. I'm not talking about that. Kingdom theology, kingdom authority is designed by God, and it works every time if we get our part right. But we're only a part of that. And here's where I find that we get into trouble. Because we sometimes are grasp, gra grappling with the wrong part. And we struggle. We fail. We don't get answers that we seem to get. I want to begin this morning. You don't necessarily have to turn there, but you can. To Matthew chapter 8. And there's a, a time as Jesus was ministering that a centurion came to him, not a believer... Uh, at least by birth, not Jewish, if you will. And he said, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. He had come to Jesus and asked him to heal his child. And Jesus, uh, obviously prone to healing the sick, uh, was open to doing that. And even going there, being led back to that place by the centurion. But the centurion said, he said, you don't have to go. You don't have to go. You can just stay here. He goes on in verse 9. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go, and he goes, and that one come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. This man, this non-believer, if you will, as far as by birth, uh, understood that Jesus had authority. He could heal. He desired to heal. And that if Jesus didn't even have to physically go there, he could just speak the word and it would be done. If you and I, standing in the authority of the Lord, can just speak the word, and that's all capital letters, then it will be done. We sang earlier, it is finished. It is finished. But it's a matter of fleshing that out, walking that out. And this man recognized that Jesus had authority. He didn't even have to physically go, but just speak the word and it would be done. And Jesus commended him for his great faith. And she was healed at that very hour before the man even was able to return to his own child. Here's the thought that I want to begin to, to develop. And it's a simple one and it's a deep one and it's a hard one all at the same time. The word... Spoken on earth will liberate heaven to defeat the enemy. And this is one of those that's just got to marinate. It's got to simmer. You got to roll this around and do some study because this does not happen naturally. It's not preached or practiced in a great deal of the American church for sure. Uh, but the word, the word, capital letters, spoken on earth, physically spoken on earth, will liberate heaven to defeat the enemy. Amen? We got a few believers. The problem again becomes when we misinterpret our part in that equation and we, get, we run into difficulties. We, uh, we often talk about the army of the Lord. 
And we talked about that some in this whole study of kingdom. And, you know, the Bible talks about a great army and the Lord of hosts. And the host most often refers to the great angelic uh, throng, if you will, thousands and tens of thousands upon tens of thousands of angels ready to do the bidding of the Lord. But as we talk about the army of the Lord, and there's some teaching out there that we are exclusively the army of the Lord, and that's not quite true. It's, it's almost true, but it's not quite true. See, the army of the Lord has a captain, and that's not us. And the angels play a part. They have a role. There's orders, there's assignments, there's different things that we are called to do. And sometimes we step into uh, another part of the army's assignment, and again, we fail because we just don't understand what our part is. Simply put this morning, our part is to speak on earth physically with flesh on the word which liberates heaven to defeat the enemy, not only in our lives, but in those places that he gives our feet to set. Again, we get a few that believe. We have trouble when we don't stay in our own lane. I grew up and I saw a lot of stuff in the Pentecostal, charismatic, full gospel, however you wanted to find a church. And there was a whole lot of shouting at the enemy and I, I, I never got that. I never really understood that. There is a time to rebuke the enemy, amen? But I do not believe that is all the time. We look at the ministry of Jesus and understand something. When Jesus came as the son of man, he was that. He was a man with flesh and blood. He was a man like us. He was not at that point, and I know this is going to mess with some of your theology, so be pre-messed. He was not all-knowing, all-powerful, all-everything in that moment, all-everywhere. Just hang on, you'll be okay. He set aside those things as the Son of God to become the Son of Man. If he continually delved back into those things, he would not have been our perfect sacrifice. And all this stuff we're doing in church is really useless because we're still under sin. The reality is he set those things aside. Now, how is it that he just did everything better than us? Holy Spirit. He was really in tune with the Father. And as, as Todd has mentioned, many have said, he only did what he saw done in heaven. He only spoke but understand, when Jesus walked around as the living word, and again, this will kind of mess with us, we are to begin to walk around as the living word. Yeah. I know, some of you are getting nervous. But if we become the living word, in other words, the word that is spoken on earth, truthfully, full of faith, led by the Spirit, not over here doing this stuff and dragging God over to bless my stuff, but walking by his spirit, then our prayers will be answered. His kingdom will come. Brokenness will become whole. Beauty will come from ashes. Amen. I don't know about you, but I, I really have no time praying prayers that don't make any difference. I really stink I wish I could use a stronger word, but this is taped. I stink at being religious. I really do. Because after a point, what's the point? What I crave in my spirit is to speak with his authority, not my own, and not drawing attention to me, but to speak with authority and know that it will be done, not because of me, but because of him. And if these parts are aligned properly, that can happen. It is happening today. The kingdom is being stirred. We're getting away from some of the extremes that have just created potholes. This whole issue of spiritual warfare has been good and bad all at the same time. 
Do not fixate on spiritual warfare. In fact, don't fixate on the battle. Fixate on Jesus. Because that's what Jesus did. He fixed his eyes on what was ahead upon his father and what he was called to do. He didn't worry about everything else. Single-minded focus. He spoke the word, and God the Father by his spirit honored that word each and every time. Stay in your proper lane. Meaning, speak the word with flesh and blood on, flesh and bone, and don't be afraid to be Jesus in those situations. Now, you can just say that. That's easy to say, but it's not about just, just witnessing. It's not about just teaching. It's not about just sharing our faith, all the different things. It's all of that and then more. And it's even as we talked about, it was mentioned uh, even in the commercial, we ought to glow with the goodness of God being Jesus on the earth today, properly exercising the authority that he's given to us. Again, there's this whole dominion theology, and I'm not talking about that, but kingdom theology is, is, uh, is what I'm talking about. One of the uh, things that we've mentioned recently, and I, I want to reaffirm it because, again, this was a part of my upbringing in the church, was that the goal is heaven, and the goal is not heaven. And that is a real dividing line for the true church today. And we could, we could spend a lot of time trying to break all that down, but if we go to the end, this earth is going to be destroyed. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. Amen? Right now, heaven is the place where God resides, and the saints who have gone before us are temporarily there. And in short version, we will be joined with them for a time of rule and reign on this earth, and we will be doing exactly then what we should be doing right here and right now. Part of the problem with the uh, heaven is the ultimate goal thinking is that it puts everything off till the end. We will rule and reign at some point instead of we should be ruling and reigning right now. Now, remember the disciples? Aren't you glad that they're in there? Because they were thick-headed. They didn't get it. They tried. They got around it. Remember when they were wrestling for a, for a position in the kingdom? When your kingdom comes, you know, can I sit on your right? Your they, were, they were trying to figure out. They knew Jesus had authority, right? But they were trying to figure out how did they get authority? How could they speak with that same kind of confidence? Remember when they went out and tried to, to cast out demons or, or do certain things in ministry? They struggled early on, and it really wasn't until the Holy Spirit came and all of the things that they had learned and watched Jesus do began to gel in them, and they began to speak with authority. Remember what the authorities, the Roman authorities said about them? These men, they're just common dudes. They're just ordinary guys. They got a hold of something. They got a hold of someone, and his name was Jesus. And they were never the same. And all of a sudden, they were saying bold things. Even in the face of authorities, they began to speak the word. They were unashamed and unafraid, and God answered their prayers. And healings took place. People were saved. What was broken became whole once again. We need to truly desire to be under the authority of the Lord, and that will be fought by our flesh every time because our flesh does not want to be ruled. And the unique thing about the kingdom is when we step under and stay under, which is not automatic because we can, you know, we can drift off out from under our authority, but when we stay under his authority, it actually liberates us to become people of great authority. That didn't get too many people excited. Everything in the kingdom is the exact opposite of what we see in our world. In our world, the strongest are the ones who get to have authority. In the kingdom, it's the servant. 
It's the humble. It's the meek. Because even as we sang this morning, it just hit me again. Do we, re- we really can't exalt. God can't be exalted any more than he already is. Amen? He can't. The only thing that can happen is I can humble myself to a greater degree. And then he's higher. And then what does he turn around and do? He says, those who will humble themselves, I will exalt. Now, this is not so we get to be super Christians and run around and do a bunch of miracles and everybody gets to give us accolades. Understand, because then we already lost it because we started out as a humble servant on our face before the Lord. Amen? And that, and I'm not real prone to visions, but that's a vision that I see happening in the church today. That godly men and women are humbling themselves to the degree, and then he's just literally reaching down and grabbing them by the hand, helping them to their feet, and they rise with great authority. And what does it say we're going to do? Greater things than he did. Which makes sense to me because there's more of us than there was of him. He limited himself in a physical body to one place at one time. He didn't tell a transport around. In fact, that it really only happened once in the Bible that we know of. And that became after uh, Jesus had gone with one of the disciples. But we will do greater things than him if we walk in the authority that he's given to us. I want to take a look this morning, and we're not going to uh, get all of this done this morning, but... I want to look at two things to help us understand the spiritual battle and what it means to be people of God's authority and ministering that to to the world around us. You can turn to Matthew chapter 4. I'm not going to read the whole passage. I encourage you to do that. But I want to look at two things uh, in trying to figure out how it is that you and I would be Jesus in the world in which we live. One is to look at Jesus' ministry. The other is we'll go back to the book of Genesis. We'll go back to the beginning and see how God originally created for things to be. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, it doesn't tell us that Jesus knew he was being led into the wilderness to be tempted by the enemy doesn't say that. He may have, he may not have. But remember, he was not all-knowing at that point. His knowledge came from his connection to the Father. Where is our knowledge, where is our knowledge supposed to come from? Our connection to the Father. His power, his authority. Everything came out of his relationship with the Father. He didn't reach into the tool chest and grab anything that isn't available to you and I. Man, there goes all my excuses right? Well, he was Jesus. But you know what? We've kind of made Jesus the man, the earthly man. We put him on such a pedestal, and we've, we've confused the Son of Man, Son of God stuff. Well, he had all these extra things that we don't have. No, he didn't. He chose not to use those things. He laid them down so that he could be an example for you and I of what it means to speak and be the word on the earth, which would liberate heaven to defeat the enemy. If I say that enough, maybe it'll stick. In fact, Jesus really only spoke the word. Here in this example, if we read through this temptation of the enemy, Jesus stuck to the word. He spoke the word audibly. And he really didn't spend the whole time talking at the enemy. He just spoke truth. We can become guilty of spending too much time talking to the enemy. What are we doing? Why? He's a defeated foe. He's already been beaten. It is finished. We need to be in the declaration stage, not the dialogue stage with the enemy. Amen? Declare what the word says. Jesus made no apologies. He made no excuses. He didn't get caught up in distractions. And what was the enemy trying to do? The enemy was trying to get Jesus, the son of man, to reach for something that came from the realm of being son of God. And God's plan would have been thwarted. Think about that. I mean, one of the examples was, hey, you can throw yourself off the cliff 
And we both know that if you speak, you can call thousands and thousands of angels and you will not be hurt in any way. And in that moment, God's plan of salvation would have derailed. The, the inauguration of the kingdom would not have happened. Jesus stuck to the word. He spoke only the word so as to repel the enemy. But he also stuck to the word, I believe, to speak to his own thoughts and his own feelings. Because the problem is never with God's word. And that should get a hearty amen. Amen. The word is always right. It is always truth. It never fails. Oh, man, again, it puts it back in our lap. The problem is with us. If we believe it so much so that we will speak it and act like it is already done and step out in faith, it liberates heaven to defeat the enemy. And instead of it being me versus the enemy, which it was never intended to be, okay, and again, he's a defeated foe anyway, it puts it in everything in the proper place, and the army of the Lord, if you will, the the body of Christ operates as it should. You and I need to fight spiritual battles as Jesus did. And many times we need to do that for one another. When we are weak, when we doubt, when we fear, when we worry, then we must come alongside one another and speak the word. You know what? What you and I think and what you and I feel doesn't change diddly squad. It doesn't. I don't know if I can say diddly squad either, but I just did. Okay, that's right. (laughs) Well, my next statement was probably even more in that too often we find ourselves getting our heinies, because I don't think I can say but, but I just did. We get our heinies kicked because we're in the wrong realm doing the wrong thing at the wrong time in the wrong way. You got to let some of this stuff roll around. And much of what I know at this point comes because of my own failures to try to get it right, to try to wrestle with this whole spiritual battle stuff. Why does it work for some people and not for me? Ever been there? I do that complex really well, don't I, honey? Works for them. Why not me? In fact, I've said many times, uh uh-oh. I've said, declared many times, why are the rules different for me than everybody else? Which is a stupid thing to say because never and ever and always is rarely true all the time. But what I've spoken is incorrect and I'm off the rails before I even get started. But the word is always true. The spirit will always lead us properly. Our part is to declare boldly, speaking out the word as it is written, as it is spoken to our hearts, which also includes the leading and anointing of the Holy Spirit and allowing heaven then to turn back the enemy and to bring life and to bring healing into a broken world. I look at the ministry of Jesus and Jesus he met the enemy head on wherever he encountered him, but he never went out looking for the devil. He just didn't. Now the devil came looking for him because his goal was to destroy the works of God and the word tells us that. And the word tells us that he will do that in our lives. He will look to destroy all of the good things that God intends to do through us. That's his job, if you will. And he's really good at it because he understands human nature. Jesus didn't seek out the enemy, neither should we. But when we encounter him, we need to take our stand. And we need to speak the word, speak into the earthly realm the word, and allow heaven to do what heaven does best. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a time to rebuke the enemy. 
There's a time to speak directly to, but that should never be our goal. Our conversation should be between us and the Lord. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're going to finish with this scripture this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 3. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Again, there's a place for us in that equation, and that is that we take the divine weapons that we have been given, we take the keys of the kingdom, those are all purchased by Christ on our behalf, we take those and we use those to destroy anything that sets itself up against God, any stronghold. Those strongholds, can I tell you, are on earth. We are not to speak to heaven. That's God's realm. Now, that doesn't mean we don't speak with him, but speaking to heaven says that I know more than he does, and I'm not happy with the job he's doing. He doesn't know how to do it right. Speak on the earth out of our relationship with the Father, utilizing what we have been given to the situation that's in front of us, to demolish and destroy everything that sets itself up against God. And again, it liberates heaven to destroy the work of the enemy. Strongholds, things in our lives, many times those are things in our own thinking, our own feeling, our own processes. Taking captive every thought, that's a hard place. That's a, that's a hard thing to do. Submitting ourselves first to God, and then we can rebuke the enemy. We can step out in full authority. I'm just going to stop there for this morning. Now, you may pray differently, think differently, uh, encounter the spiritual battle differently, and I, I say just take a big breath and relax because you may have heard something and say well that's not right or that's not exactly the way I look at it I just said we're not to pray at heaven I don't believe we pray at stuff we pray with our heavenly father because it's not my job I don't know everything do you guys I don't there are things I don't know and I know enough to know that I don't but I know who does know. And so my prayer becomes, God, help me see around the corner. Help me to see past the crooked places to the straight place, the level ground, which we prayed before we started. Because that's a regular prayer of mine because I know that I am limited in my flesh, but I know that in my spirit, I am unlimited. Some of you got to warm up to that one. You have everything you need at your disposal, just like Jesus did. We've got to use it. We have to use it. Worship team, you can go ahead and